That movie sucked. I kind of liked it. Movie Night Crew Network. What's up, everyone? And a very, very happy Pride Month to you all. I don't know if you've picked up on this, but this podcast is gay. So I just wanted to stop by briefly before this episode to wish my fellow queers a very happy Pride Month. I love each and every one of you little babies. Please have fun and be safe celebrating and check back in a fortnight for the Restricted Sections Pride Month episode. Anyway, it's time for the show. Please enjoy. Welcome to the Restricted Section, where it's all about the trauma. I'm your host, Christina. I'm joined today by my friend, Haley. Say hello to the listeners, Haley. Hello, listeners. I'm Haley. How is your fish, Haley? Um, we're dealing with a little case of fin rot, but I think we're going to be okay. Is this like a zombie fish? No, it, no, no, no. It's like an it's, it's like most beta fish get it at least once, and it's just like like their fins will grow back, but they kind of get there's a little bacteria situation, and they get kind of ripped looking. It's almost like molting if they grow back again. Uh, yeah, like they it, like it is going to grow back, but we're we're being diligent about our water parameters. Oh my god. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for sharing. <laughs> Do keep us updated. We'll do. I'm also joined today by my other friend, Leela. Say hello to the listeners, Leela. Hello, listeners. I am other friend. (laughs) How are your cats? My cats are doing great. Um, Gus and Pam are, you know, just always fighting, but like in a super cute way. So, (laughs) yeah, I'm sure it's very cute for Pam, I assume, is the one being targeted in most of these. Yeah. uh, Sometimes that little bit, she, she does a little bit of a... Double snap, yeah. double slap, you know, out of nowhere. Penny's the same. Penny loves to punch a baby. For sure. <laughs> yeah. That's why I get along so well with Penny. <laughs> yeah, you guys really see each other. Feeling really comfortable about being pregnant in this friend group. Right I now. have I have warned you not to let me babysit. I've warned you many times. <laughs> uh, I'm flashing back to when our friend Sarah brought her cat um, Norman over and... <laughs> My cats were extreme bullies, including a couple face punches. Cats just punch each other on the face. It's just a thing they do. I am also, (laughs) also joined by my other, other friend, Brooke. Say hello to the listeners, Brooke. You've met the heirs. Welcome to the spare. Hello, (laughs) listeners. (laughs) How is the parasite? (laughs) She's fine. She's feisty as shit. She's kicking the hell out of me <gasps> internally. Is that exciting and terrifying at the same time? That's mostly exciting. It's very rare that she does something that's like unbearably uncomfortable, but she's mm. big enough now that I know where she is and I can poke her into a better position. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> that's very funny. Um, cohabiting in the smallest smallest meaning of the word. <laughs> and how is your dog whose name is Maple? crushed it (laughs) she's fine she um she's been wild and out recently i was on vacation for a while so she was at a doggy daycare which is her favorite place (laughs) oh is it really isn't she a bit of a diva no she loves people and other animals so she just like that's fun it's very funny because you can like watch the cameras and she's just like constantly annoying the staff. Like she's like following <laughs> them around with like her nose on their leg. Oh, wait, you have access to the cameras at the doggy daycare? They have like an app with a live feed. That's very cool. A lot of them do that. Oh. Wow. I uh, sometimes babysit my next door neighbor who is 10 months old. Um, she has parents. They are also my next door neighbors. Um, <laughs> and they, she has like a baby monitor, you know, and th- those are nice. It's nice to not be able to, to be able to not worry. And right now I have some bread rising and I was like, fuck, I really need a baby <laughs> monitor for my bread. <laughs> what if it rises too much? Oh, I don't God, think I'm that's a thing. I don't think it can rise too much. As long as it doesn't get moldy, you should be fine. I don't want it to get too big because I'm making loaves, like meat loaves of bread. And what if 
it's just so bulbous on the top. It would look ridiculous. But a fluff, a fluffy top is a good top. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll, I feel like uh, it'll be I'll fine. I'll update you guys later. <laughs> Either that, or we'll actually have to, for once, stick to the mantra of this should be a short episode. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that's not going to happen. I think we all know well, that. Well, I, I just, I, I just won't know because I didn't get the bread baby monitor, so it's just a yellow situation. Hey, do you guys want to develop an app? It's called Bread Watch. <laughs> <laughs> Haley, Haley, there is so a market for that. Oh, unfortunately, you're completely right. Maybe I should do that. I mean, isn't that essentially how the webcam got invented? The first. Yeah, I guess that you're just talking about all of the Ring security cameras I have in my house. I mean, so the first webcam, like webcam technology, was invented so that the i forget which smart kid school it was i want to say mit they literally set up a live feed camera so that they could see in the break room when the coffee was finished brewing wow (laughs) i respect that so much can i just say get you a coffee pot that screams at you when it's done (laughs) like mine no one likes a bragger Yeah, I'm making bread today because my mom was talking a lot yesterday about how she has no idea how to use her stand mixer. And I'm like, it's not that hard. And she's like, I wanted it so bad four years ago. And then I got it and I never touched it. And I'm like, it's actually not that hard of a tool. Like, and so today I'm really spitefully (laughs) making bread. If she doesn't want it, I'm looking to purchase one and I will buy it off her. No, I'm, I think she actually wants to use it. Oh, okay. Well, I'll let her know that if she's ready to give up on her dream. Well, I'm sure she wanted to, to use it four years ago when she got it. So <laughs> I was going to say, if she doesn't want it, I'll take it for free. <laughs> anyway, we're not here today to talk about bread, although we're doing a great job being in denial about the tragic end of Goblet of Fire that we're all, I'm sure, reeling from. For, uh, for the 17th time, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i recently recorded an episode that we have coming out later this summer where i got three of my non-harry potter nerd friends to try to explain to me the plot of harry potter and when they mentioned cedric diggory first of all here's a little sneak peek of that episode they called him cedric didgeridoo and i don't know if it was a mistake and i was like he just died in the books like that character just died so let's just do a quick cheers and they were like what who, who are you talking about? The actor died? Robert Pattinson died? Oh I thought God. it was Batman. I thought it was oh Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw him the other day as Bruce Wayne. <laughs> like, I'm freshly traumatized by this death, and y'all are calling him such a didgeridoo. <laughs> that is really the tone of the whole episode, so just buckle up and get ready for that. But today we're here for an episode that I'm calling Group Therapy. The rest of the series requires a group therapy session after reading. Um, I was just looking ahead earlier today at our Order of the Phoenix. I wasn't even reading it. I was just looking at the chapters and I was like, oh, this is, oh, right. And then this, oh, God, okay. So we're going to need some group therapy after this one, too. I think it just goes on like that. Mm, Yep. And then once we get to the end of Deathly Hallows, it will only be group therapy forever as we try to figure out what to do with our lives next. We'll find something, I'm sure. (laughs) <laughs> so I have a couple listener emails, a couple listener questions, a couple of my own questions. Sean, I guess, said something because it says right here, question from Sean. Don't remember that. Don't remember. There's no way he like wrote that in. I'm sure I just was like, oh, I don't know. Right that, on the episode. that sounds like a prank that Sean would pull. No, 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 no. That requires so many steps, Haley. I don't know. Sometimes he dedicates himself really, really hard to a joke just to sneak it in. It's true. So we're going to start <laughs> with a banger. Um, we're going to start with an email from Zach, the host of Belated Binge, who came on the restricted section for our longest episode ever, Veritas Serum, with me, Zach, and Haley. It was about two and a half hours because that it's the whole plot of the book. As a reminder, that chapter is the whole plot of the book. And here's how I did it all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So shout out to Zach because he, he was really in it with us for the long haul and i'm so grateful to him um and he'll definitely be back for a chapter in order of the phoenix um oh and i'm supposed to go on believe basically just follow us for all the updates okay great here's an email from zach and i'm gonna put a trigger warning right here for <clears throat> well and maybe <laughs> i should ask if you guys are even okay with this question just a little bit of light uh like like baby death in this uh fan email <laughs> in this listener email 
Um, Which it's about baby? Bertha, it's about Bertha <laughs> Jorkins. Y'all know the theory that we're talking about. Oh, mm-hmm. I, I think I remember talking about it on the longest episode. How does someone lightly kill a baby? <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's, I think it's technically a, a fetus <laughs> murder. <laughs> Oh, and I don't want to get into the politics of that. <sighs> um, trigger warning. He, the The subject line of the email is trigger warning, fucked up shit beyond this point. I'm just going to read it. There's a theory for your episode today. Thank you, Zach, for sending this whenever that episode came out. That Bertha Jorkins was pregnant when Voldemort killed her. And he took over the fetus's form as something, somewhat of a test of taking on a body or some sort of possession. And that's the baby form explanation. Now go watch videos of kittens or some shit to cleanse your soul. So <laughs> we're starting in real light here with, did Voldemort possess an unborn child? So, okay, question then. Would Bertha have been pregnant by Peter Pettigrew in this example? Um, I think she was just on vacation. I think she could have been pregnant by anybody. I got the impression that she was, uh, like, older. Like, potentially postmenopausal. I don't... She is actually... Uh, was at school at the same time as Sirius, at least. Um, and Sirius is only supposed to be, like, 32. So I think she is uh, our age. Uh, well, we are older. <laughs> we are older. Than some. So okay. there's that. But I don't think it's super likely, but I'll let you finish, Brooke. I I don't think it's super likely because of the way that the potion ends up working. I feel like if there was an actual possessed body entered into the equation, that it would have fucked up the resurrection potion. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Because you would Mm. be trying to resurrect, like, that form. Right. I don't... I think it could... You would have ended up with wires crossed somewhere in that scenario. You know what I mean? Interesting. The phrasing of getting our wires crossed is making me laugh so hard. Like, Wormsdale going to Voldemort and being like, hey, bud, I'm sorry. It actually looks like it didn't work. I guess we got our wires crossed. (laughs) As if that is at all helpful. (laughs) I'm more just imagining, like, a Deadpool scenario where it's like they resurrected half adult Voldemort and then half, like, baby hands, you know? (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) It's like a Rick and Morty bit, baby legs. <laughs> <laughs> so not to put my nerd hat on this early in the episode, but... Do it! You... What other hats do you even have? Oh, you got the cute flower hat. I do have the cute <laughs> flower hat, God damn it! Thank um, you. Sh- Sean Ward in the woods last weekend, and it was really cute. It was really cute. Um... With his crop top. <laughs> he was living his best life. Uh, but I think... Yeah, besides it being kind of far-fetched, like, the whole thing, like, there's so many things that would have had to happen off stage for that theory to be true. Um, I'm just thinking about alchemy, which was, like, a huge factor of the first book with, like, the Philosopher's Stone and all that. Like, that all goes back to alchemy, which was, like, pre-chemistry. Like, it was, it was back before people quite knew... The difference between like the like where the line was between science and just straight up magic. So yeah. alchemists were people who were like doing some actual real science stuff and developing a lot of the tools that are used even today, like in chemistry labs, but they were also involving like runes and zodiac shit and trying to find the secret to immortality. And one of the like pursuits of alchemy that's kind of connected to the immortality thing was creating artificial human life um so this sounds like a homunculus which is oh yeah like i think the greek translation comes out to like little dude it's it's like a little person that people would try to make and turn into a whole guy so ask me how i know what a homunculus is is it full metal alchemist Oh, it's actually not. It's Hello from the Magic Tavern. Really? Yeah, there's a character who's like, yeah, I'm made out of spit, jizz, blood, and bile of this guy. That's basically what a homunculus is. Alchemy got real gross sometimes, and it kind of sounds like the process of making Voldemort's little little vessel thing was probably pretty gross itself, judging by what it ended up looking like. I feel like the homunculus is also from Jewish folklore. 
Are you talking about? Are you thinking of, golem? I'm thinking of a golem? I'm thinking of a golem. A golem is like no. I don't think it has to have the bodily fluids, but it is like a um, clay or similar like model of a yeah, person. Yeah, no. That... A, a golem is it's it's more like an automaton. <laughs> I like a clay person over a part jizz person. If we have oh, to choose sure. what Voldemort's made out of. Hey. I'm not that prejudiced, but I don't want to talk to someone who's made out of jizz. You know what I mean? Wait, but at the same time, aren't we all made out of jizz? <laughs> Maybe the real jizz was the bodies we built along the way. Uh, all right, Leela, what do you think of the terrible fetus stealing uh, theory? Yeah, it sounds terrible. Um, <laughs> okay, but great. at least it's interesting and like I, I, it would give definitely more weight to Bertha Jorkins, who is, I feel like, so forgettable to in this in this book, so. Hashtag never forget. Yeah. No, that's a 9-11. Oh, phrase. no. <laughs> it can be two <laughs> things. Wrong joke for Memorial Day week. Oh. <laughs> Hashtag never forget Bertha Jorkins. In it's funny crowd. because she was super forgetful. Ha. Oh, man. She probably had undiagnosed ADHD, not to be this person. No, she, she it was, the, like it was it. the memory charm. It was the fucked up memory charm that fucked up her memory. Oh, man. That or I just have a fucked up memory charm <laughs> really? oh what did God. i see i could hey, see an adult neville and bertha jorkins actually hitting it off regardless oh my of God, the no someone has to be in charge idea? someone has to be in charge of remembering the things in a relationship one at least one person has to remember <laughs> the things neville got it together enough to be a whole ass professor okay like, all right i feel like they would just have a charming home of misplaced objects like fortunately magic helps a lot with that you know what i mean so yeah. it's like, you never actually have to remember where you put the keys. You can accio that shit. Oh my god, you're so right about that. Actually, magic is an enabler. Or is you don't it, have to learn how to put anything anywhere. It's true. Or is it an amazing tool to someone, an, a nice adaptive tool to someone? Both? Both. Why not both? <laughs> yeah, ¿por qué no los dos? <laughs> well, they have magic, but we have post-it notes, so, you know, it all balances out. <laughs> post-it notes are great. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, for the next phase of our group therapy, I would like to get into a couple specific Goblet of Fire ships. And I have three written down that I want to talk about, but I would love to hear about any other ships that y'all would like to talk about. Um, the first one on my list is a pretty intense fan theory. And by intense, I mean, I think that the people who believe this so deeply believe this, that Ron Weasley is bisexual. And in this book, he's like, doesn't realize it may be any of this, but he is experiencing feelings of being into both Hermione and Crumb, which is why them dating each other was like so exceptionally hard for him. What do we think? Of that, Ron feels like the least bi coded character I've ever read. People hmm. surprise you though. No, because here's the thing: is like he has the same type of like obsessive protective relationship with Harry. I feel like, and we know that that's not romantic. You know what I mean? Like, I think he's just starstruck. I think people that believe this have never met a celebrity. <laughs> You know, like, you just do dumb shit. And that's, like, especially even for celebrities that only mean something to you. Like, I met Shaky Graves. Oh, for sure. Which is, a, he's a great musician. A lot of people don't know who that is. And I could not make words come out of my mouth. <laughs> like, Michael was, my husband was sitting there staring at me, taking a picture. And I was literally just like, I like your music so much. It doesn't really. It's just like everything you can say is the wrong thing to say. <gasps> right. And he was like, that is the funniest thing I've ever seen. Because as soon as we like walked away from the scenario, I was like, wow, that was great. And he was like, oh, my God, you 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 came back to us. Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's very cute. Lila, what's your take on is Ron bisexual? I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. I think it's fun. I like it. <laughs> Why not? You know, yeah. uh, I think it would it would explain. I mean, yeah, I guess it would like it it'd be an easy way to explain the the crumb obsession. But I agree, Brooke, that like if there was an actual celebrity at your high school, you would probably behave in a similarly or similarly weird way. 
So who knows? Yeah, I just think that both of those explanations for why Ron is so awkward are valid. Yeah. And like they can both be true at the same time. Yeah. No, it's like it's not something that I would have thought of myself. But then again, a lot of the like by men that I've met throughout my life are like guys that it would kind of surprise you and it kind of like surprised them it was just like a like not a in a huge like life altering way just in the like huh yeah oh, exactly. is that what that means oh i yeah. i guess all right well then i guess i i guess i am by what do you know i i think i will probably catch some shit for saying this but i think this falls firmly into the category for me of like there are straight people in the world like there are just people who are straight <laughs> you know what i mean just walking around out there like having, I don't having no other romantic it, interests. You know I, mean? <laughs> I don't know. Harry Potter, I think, is is is, is I, like with the notable exception of Draco Malfoy. I think Harry's mostly straight, and like the Draco this, thing is just that's just a them thing. Is this the right time for me to remember that I forgot to say Happy Pride at the top of the episode because this is coming out on June first? You're doing great. <laughs> But well, no, it's man. like it's it doesn't have to be true, but it is I don't know, I that's a fun take on it. That's it's fun looking at things from different angles, and that's an angle that things don't get looked at often enough, and that's yeah. why people like trying to like pushing it in there, even if it doesn't necessarily work for the character. But with Ron, I think an argument could be made in either way. Okay. So I think we've made all of our thoughts clear about is Ron bisexual? And this is one that I specifically would love to hear literally anyone's take on because I, I'm just fascinated by this. Uh, I'm just fascinated, fascinated by everything Ron does because he is so, so unfathomably out of touch with his own feelings that he's like really hard to access as a character. Homie's a loose Chudley cannon. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Okay, here's the next ship I want to talk about. And this ship... This ship is canon. I'm like, do I know how to talk fandom lingo? This ship is canon, but I also just want to talk. I want to examine it a little bit. So, and this is especially interesting to think about, like, between the film and the book, too. I want to talk about Rubius Hagrid and, uh, what's her name? Olymp Maxime. Is that her name? Olymp? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, probably sounds so much better with a French accent. I... I don't know, man. The movie definitely is like, well, they're both gigantic, so obviously they go together. And I don't feel like we get to see a lot of them being like actually compatible at all in terms of personality. It's it's just like, well, look at them. They match each other. And that like makes me that makes me mad a little bit. I don't mm -hmm. know. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean that I was just listening to catching up on the last episode in the car when you guys talked about this a little bit. Yeah, it, the movie episode. Yeah, the movie episode. Nice. Yeah, just because it, it is very, it's just kind of like, uh, hey, I'm big, you're big, we be together, because both big. It mm. does, it does kind of like, just the whole setup does kind of read that way, although I think that, like, one of the things that people enjoy about fandom, right, is that you can play around so much, like, the the series that become big fandoms aren't necessarily, like, the most well-written ones all of the time. A lot of them are ones that have unexplored stuff that could very easily and rightfully be criticized, and then we'll just take that thing that wasn't fully explored and give it what they think it deserves. And I think that this is a relationship you could do that with. Like, you could really flesh out those two and make them feel extremely authentic with what you're given because like mm -hmm. yeah olymp is she's a fancy broad but uh she's she was given hagrid a look and you know it's, it's some some women are into the uh it, like some people in general really are into the the lumberjack thing <laughs> and it's uh, i don't blame hagrid her is what we call a bear <laughs> mm, there we go I feel like they fell into this weird thing where it's like, obviously, they've got a lot of emotional connection because they came from s somewhat similar backgrounds and it's unique within their society, mm -hmm. right? But it's also one of those things where I think they're just like, oh, 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 we're the same. Should we fuck? Oh, no, wait. No, 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 no. Maybe we should just be friends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I think that there's uh, curiosity there, but I think it pans better as friendship than ultimately than it does as like a sexual romantic connection. Yeah. Uh, have y'all heard that joke? Is he hot or just tall? 
Yeah. I feel like Madame Maxime stays being like, is that guy hot or just tall? No, like that's that's her thought process through the whole book. Like, is he hot though? Well, <laughs> and here's the most unforgivable thing that they did in the movie. And I don't, the most unforgivable thing that they did in the movie to try to establish a connection between these characters was to have her eat a bug out of his fucking beard. <laughs> was it a bug? When was that? What if it was Rita Skeeter? Wouldn't that be a twist? <laughs> There's a part where she like literally pulls maybe something like out food. of his I beard. thought it was yeah. cute. I mean, it was disgusting, but I thought it was like a little crumb and she was like being very flirty. No? Okay. Also disgusting. Also disgusting. Like, yeah, it's just... <laughs> I'm like, if, maybe if it's like a whole, and then I'm like, in what food, maybe like a whole blueberry <laughs> with like, like a protective skin on it. What is the, the fact tree? that the movie, the fact that the movie was like, we really need to solidify this quick, this uh, connection quick, have her eat something out of his beard. Oh, it's, like, it's bad. Why don't it's I remember a this moment? unforgivable Haley, choice. oh my God, it's not subtle. How did I not catch this? I feel like I would have caught this. She tries to make it, they try to make it sexy. Yeah. They have her like suck her finger afterwards. It's during like, the sexy montage, you know, the one I'm talking about where it's got like French no, music No, I like I know the montage. I just... I have no I I have no memory of this place. She gives him a little scrumptious mm, mm. after doing it. I'm upset. I'm it upset is upsetting. Now. That's upsetting. Upset, yes. So but that's the point that I'm trying to make is that like trying to find a picture of it like in <laughs> in media res so I can but there's not it's probably a video situation. I, I think the point here is that like I it it I think is a thing that like it gets coded as romantic and there is some like romantic undertone to it but i think a lot of it is just hormonal children looking at two adults meeting each other who are as we've mentioned the same and being like well they've got to be into each other yeah i would have probably preferred to have seen them as a slow burn that turns into like uh like a partnership that is like it actually it actually literally doesn't matter if it's romantic because yeah. it, we're like a partner yeah, sure. I feel like that must be what happened on their France trip. Oh, because he does. Oh, yeah. I do remember him like talking about anything. Like, I just remember him talking about like, oh, yeah, no, she's actually great at camping and amazing at fighting. And I'm just hell. Yeah. And <laughs> I like I want to I want to read that. I want to read that yeah. fan fiction of like, what did they get up to? Yeah, that's that would be a great little novella or but whatever. Now I need another. I'm going to get another drink. I need one now. Okay. <laughs> Um, I guess we can wait for her to come back. Does anyone else have any other ships they want to talk about? Uh, um, I would like to discuss the um, Bill and Fleur. Oh yeah, that does that start here, like so briefly. Yeah, because yeah. it's like it's one of those things where uh, I saw like a like a Tumblr thread or something that got posted on Facebook where it's just like imagine seventeen year old Fleur. She literally like sees this hot dragon tamer in the background and is like, "I'm just gonna store that away for later." Wait, no, he's the, um, he works for oh, Gringotts. Right. Because he, 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 he comes in to cooler. see Harry. He comes he in looked, to see Harry. Uh, there, oh, wait, hold on. What, it said, like, <laughs> there was no other way to describe it. He looked cool. <laughs> it was, like, cool. with his <laughs> dot, dot, bang dot. earring and ponytail. <laughs> but, no, she, she like, literally sees him visiting Harry. Yeah, that's right. Before the, the final task. And is just, like, I'm just going to tuck that away in the back of my brain. I'm like, I'm going to get, I'm going to try to get a job in this English ministry. We'll see how that goes. But like, if I run into this dude again, I'm going to aggressively pursue him. And yeah. she does. Yeah. Good for you. Guys, Wizarding good Europe. For you, girl. It's a small world, you know, you'll run into him again. <laughs> yeah. It's it's like so subtle. It's it, it. I'm pretty sure the narrative is like, Harry was like, why the fuck does she keep looking at him? I don't know. Anyway, I'm really nervous about this task or like, whatever. yeah, yeah. I just love that that little seed gets planted in this book yeah. where she's like, I'm impossibly hot and I'm very intrigued by this band in the corner. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. They mentioned the the lone dangling uh, like dragon was a dragon tooth. Yeah, yeah I guess so. Yeah. Earring. Um, fun fact, when my mom met my dad in the 80s, he oh um, uh, had a dangling Star of David earring. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Oh my and my mom was like, "It was just so exotic, you know." Like, oh, oh I love that. I love everything about that. 
So what a great origin story. Oh my god, exotic. Those lovebirds. <laughs> I know. I'm sure my dad was like, finally, someone thinks I'm interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, the last ship I wrote down is just, uh, I've always wondered, Ginny and Neville, they look like they had a good time together. Probably just a, a just friends situation, but, you know, I think they would have had fun in a relationship together. Yeah, I ship it. I love those two mm. kids together. They seem like a like a good match to me. I think that they would have a nice couple of months and then Ginny would realize that she likes a more dangerous, uh, like more of a bad boy and would, it would, Tina, don't you have a story of breaking up with a two. boy for being too nice? I, br- I have broken up with two men for being too nice. Yeah, I think it <laughs> might be a that situation. It sounds like a that situation. Cause remember like she's, she's not used to a, a guy who's going to, be a gentleman she's used to her brothers and like that's that's the kind of camaraderie that she wants is like roughhousing yeah it's not a (laughs) roughhouser just jenny and harry wrestling just for fun could you imagine how much neville would just get swallowed at a weasley family dinner oh my god (laughs) right i don't want that for him i don't want to put jenny through having to break up with him because you know she'd have to do it he's not gonna do it (sighs) Mm -hmm. yeah it's just oh like it would be cute for a bit i think they'd both learn a lot about themselves she would say she would say let's promise to always stay friends and he would agree but it would be hard for him but in six months to a year he'd come around and be like all right i'm ready to just be friends again yeah Okay. Any other ships we want to talk about from Goblet of Fire? I don't think so. Okay, great. No one cares about ships like I do. (laughs) It's time for another owl mail. I don't think I said owl mail when I read the last owl mail. And the more you say owl mail, the harder it gets to say. But it is time for our next piece of owl mail. Hoot hoot. This one's from our friend Amy. And... If y'all don't remember writing these emails, it's because I've been collecting them for like six months. Like I'm whenever there's an email that didn't work neatly into a future episode, I was like, well, I'll just throw that on the this episode. Okay, so this is from Amy. Amy says, hi again. Question for you guys. And this is backtracking a little. Well, now it's backtracking a lot, Amy. So good job. (laughs) Uh, I remember one of the original fan questions was whether or not Barty Crouch Jr. originally even was a Death Eater, or if he was actually caught with the wrong people at the wrong time and became evil in a twist of gross irony. I believe how the theory works, it's been like 20 years, forgive me, isn't that he was completely innocent per se, but that he somehow didn't know what he was getting into until he was in the thick of it, then became Bellatrix Lestrange levels of evil once he went to Azkaban, then had to be hidden at home. I've never known whether or not I believe that theory, but I think it's interesting. What do you guys think? Great podcast as always. I have a lot of thoughts about the fifth book, so I'm sure you'll be hearing from me, Amy. Amy, please do send us lots of thoughts about the fifth book because I am terrified to cover it on this podcast. So the theory here is that Barty Crouch tripped and fell into a Death Eater rope. (laughs) Um, yes. Or, like, maybe not tripped. It's like, I'm trying to go smoke weed with my friends, but then suddenly they're doing meth. And it's like, this is an order of magnitude that I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't ready for this difference. Do you guys um, know of Josh Johnson at all? He's kind of an up-and-coming comedian. Is he made up? Um, really, no, really he, made up. No, he's a real dude. Um, okay. He's right. been uh, He's been getting more and more attention, but the first bit of his that I saw was, like, a video of, like, a tight 15 that he did about uh, his friend accidentally attending a clan rally. <laughs> Basically, wow. he they invite you to a barbecue and it, like you're you're just, you know, there's brisket, there's ribs, there's cornbread. It's all happening, it's all there. You're just having fun. You're eating the food. Someone's putting on a sheet. You're like, "Huh, I didn't realize this was a costume party." Uh, uh. You turn ar- back around and oh, they they've got sloppy joes and corn and this is fantastic. And then there's a cross on fire and you're like, I'm already here. (laughs) (laughs) Similarly, I had a friend in college that came over to our dorm and was like, I just, a weird fraternity just tried to recruit me to come to one of their cookouts. And we were like, what fraternity? And he was like, um, Kappa Kappa Kappa. And we're like, (gasps) the KKK. (laughs) And he was like, oh shit. Oh Um, my God. 
So it's like, okay, fine. I understand how you end up at the barbecue, but there's a decision (laughs) point where you Mm -hmm. don't leave. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. It's just that there's no context for, like, this crime that he commits that puts him in Azkaban, and the book says that there isn't, a like, a real trial. So I think, like, those two things mean that what actually happened could be almost anything. Like, he could have really been standing there being like, guys, what the fuck? Don't do this. I'm not this evil. <laughs> Like, the the one thing that, and I think I might have talked about this on the longest episode, which is what I'm calling it from now on. Yes, um, the longest episode. <laughs> until we're, uh, until the throne is usurped and there's another <laughs> longer episode. <laughs> um, but, like, I do remember being kind of confused about, like, in the pensive when you see the trial go down, he's, like, denying everything and being like, no, 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 it wasn't me, I'm not with them. And then, like, fast forward, what, 13 uh, years, and suddenly it's like, oh, no, I'm actually uh, Lord Voldemort's most loyal supporter, uh, come to think of it. I am going to go deep cover for a full year as a dude I've never met. Do an accent, presumably. Teach Mm -hmm. a class, multiple classes, like a whole curriculum. Mm -hmm. Like, that's dedication, so what's the truth? And I just want to know more, you know? I think if if he were actually in just, like, a bad situation, like, he had so many options to, like, turn people in or be like, oof, this was too much. I'm going to remove myself fully. And so, like, I don't know. It seems like he was pretty happily along for the ride until he got caught. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely how the narrative frames him anyway, is just this evil guy doing evil stuff. It, well, like, I think I almost get it better now like these days because like we've seen the rise of like in real life like actual far-right nationalism and like that kind of mentality which like obviously this is fiction it's not a direct parallel Mm -hmm. but like seeing a kid from like a household that is staunchly against all of these beliefs uh just kind of get into it for reasons that are never fully explained is something that we see more and more of in the world right now unfortunately so it's like i but i don't know enough about the home life i don't know enough about the crouches in general to see where Mm -hmm. his motivation would be coming from the thing is is like i think people really want an explanation for something that's really terrible but the explanation is ultimately that they weren't that put off by all of the racism and murder (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's like to like to dive into it like that hard, you need to have had a certain level of hate for someone else built up in you. Like he was so like I clearly there this is a organization that radicalizes people to their ideology, but like I don't know I I just don't know his frame of reference for the entire world. I mean it's it's obvious that he's got some daddy issues. Oh, for sure. <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> I don't think that started with that trial. <laughs> no, no. I like. I want to. I am absolutely positive that whatever the reasons might be, the daddy issues are a major contributing factor. Yeah, and I think a lot of people just with sometimes with trauma, sometimes not really with trauma, but just with a specific personality, are just like looking for like a group to belong to. That's like how people get into so many cults. And I mean, the Death Eaters are a cult to Voldemort, really. For sure. No, for sure a cult. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. (laughs) What is it? What is it? uh, Live your, and being a Death Eater, is it live your own life, watch your back or get the fuck out? What do we think? Oh, yeah. That's a get the (laughs) fuck out. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, obviously. What was, wait, what show is that? It's uh, it sounds like a cult. Sounds like a cult. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Foot fetish is a, that's a great cult to be part of. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Them puppies too. My puppy's too crusty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much for that email, Amy. I hope we answered it to your satisfaction. <laughs> Somehow the conversation got to crusty <clears throat> Uh Our next topic of conversation, uh, I'm being really organic, aren't I, with the conversation (laughs) it's so well organized which is my note card to the next one our next topic of conversation is a question from sean and i guess 
<laughs> trigger warning for suicidal ideation. I don't know. Slash suicide chat chat. But Sean, I guess, asked me, can a person use a vada cadavra on themselves? Hmm. I don't see why not. Right? I On the one hand, I feel like surely you could. I don't think... Like, spells don't often have safeties, you yeah. know what I mean? Hmm. Yeah, I guess you're right about <laughs> that one. Um, But they can't murder their own brother wand brothers, uh, yeah. Uh, like the Priori and Cantatum situation. Yeah, but I don't think your brain is your brother wand. <laughs> this is a really... <laughs> No, no, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> but like wands do kind of bind to people, so mm. but no, people but... do injure themselves with their wands all the time. Yeah. Like you can certainly right. kill yourself, like just just blowing something up and then catching yourself in the crossfire. But like it depends mm. on like the mechanism of Avada Kedavra, because if it's like summoning something to come kill you, then I'm sure that would work. But if it's somehow using your own power to end a life than like using like that might kind of cancel each other out i mean here's the thing spells have to be created by people right like that's mm. that's a thing in the universe spells are, are created by people not that it's even remotely clear how any of that works but. i mean but you know they they'll like credit certain people with like discovering mm. inventing spells whatever it's like i don't think the person that was creating the murder spell was like oh, i better make sure that this can't be used for suicide that would be worse <laughs> mm. i guess you're right about that i'm thinking about when i used to work at claire's and i used to do ear piercings and I would take the ear piercing gun and I would go to the mirror when the store was empty and I would like hold it up to my ear and I'd be like, all right, we're going to pierce our ears. We pierce lots of ears all the time. We're going to pierce our ears. And like my hand just literally couldn't do it. Like it just it just straight up couldn't do it. Couldn't pierce my own ears. That's going to hurt enough that I just uh, couldn't do it myself. And I would hope that that was it would be how Avada Kedavra would work. Yeah. So you got to really want it. Well, that's all suicide, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess you're right about yeah. that. <laughs> hmm. I mean, I guess kind of good to know that if you're, there's a potential that if your wand just senses that you're not, like, super serious about it, it's like, well, maybe not. <laughs> it's, like when you, it's like when you try to delete an account on social media, like, <laughs> like hey, just you sure? so you know, if you delete this, you can't get it back, your account <laughs> will be gone. <laughs> or like, oh my god. <laughs> or like if you're not serious about it what if you're just like fucking around with your friends and you're like uh and they like start roasting you and you're like oh fuck me how about a cadaver and then like all of a sudden you'd kill yourself you know Whoa. that'd be pretty bad i feel like you gotta say it with meaning yeah. in the first place <laughs> to cadabra. make it go <laughs> oh my god <laughs> i feel like that sh- all this shit happens with just actual guns which are way scarier than oh yeah lot. this is yeah oh. single uh, like i mean single purpose at least more straightforward wow (sighs) interesting okay well thanks sean thanks for that uh (laughs) that fucking question i guess he probably has no idea when he asked me this either maybe it was a different sean i don't know do you know another sean uh technically yes (laughs) okay it seems like something that he would have said like while you were stoned at some point and you were like, oh my God, Sean, that's such a good question. I'm going to write that on the list. And then you ran upstairs and wrote it on the list and then completely forgot the next day. Hey, I can access the list from my phone, okay? I'm an adult. Okay, there you go. (laughs) I didn't know if these were, you said note cards. I recently, no, I was joking about the note cards because of how forced my conversation sounds this evening. Um, No, I recently figured out how to have like my personal accounts, my work accounts, and my podcast accounts all on my phone, and it has changed my life. Nice. I had to have someone explain it to me. Anyway, uh, we have an email from Adele, which, like, uh, this was for sure from a while ago, because um, she's talking about the Veritas Serum episode, which was, um, I guess, maybe between three and seven episodes ago. Adele says, hey, Restricted Section Gang, I'm catching up on the pod and just listened to the Veritas Serum episode and was thinking about the mechanics of Barty Crouch Jr. taking the polyjuice potion. Aren't we all thinking about that? I'm assuming he was using the real Moody's wand the whole time he was undercover. Do you think 
the potion tricked the wand? Or was there some sort of pushback from the wand since we know they are such m powerful magical items and form close bonds with their owners? It's cool that we're wow. talking about this kind of. Yeah. Um, or in the struggle with Moody, did Barty Crouch Jr. win the allegiance of Moody's wand uh, the way Harry eventually does with Draco's? In book seven, Hermione uses Bellatrix's wand when she impersonates her at Green Gods, but she didn't win it properly as far as I can recall. I so wish we knew more about Barty Jr.'s scheme and how he managed to do it. As always, it's a pleasure listening to the pod. Bye for now, Adele. Adele. As always, it's a pleasure reading your emails. Uh, what? None of this has ever made any sense to me, pretty much straight up. I mean, I my personal theory would be that he won the wand in the fight at some point. Like, that that seems the most straightforward. Yeah. What's that? I learned something recently, and it's, like, the law that the simplest answer is often the right answer. Do you guys know Occam's what, yeah. what I'm talking Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor. Occam's yeah. Razor. Yeah, I think Zach taught me that recently. I was listening to something. Maybe an episode of my guys. Anyway. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> no, I agree. I, I think it's one of those things where it's, like, I also have just always enjoyed the fact that wands are, like, Victorian gentlemen. It's, like, you win a boxing match, and they're, like, oh, tally ho, good shit. <laughs> <laughs> I shall go get a drink with you. <laughs> I, oh. I, I'm, I'm assuming that's how they all talk now, from <laughs> yeah, now I on. I love that a lot. Um, I love that. Yeah, wands are so fickle. Like, what are they What are they even doing? They have little personalities, right? It, like, the wand chooses the wizard until, like, what, you decide to cheat on me? I just, it's like... <laughs> All right. The wand <laughs> chooses a wizard until the wand finds out you're a fucking cook. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I can't just go out and grab another wand like some hussy, then I don't see why my wand can just get another wielder. You like, can't that's... just go out and grab another wand like no, some hussy. No, you can't, though. You can't grab, like, Here's someone else's thing. wand if you didn't win it properly. Mm, it's like a car, maybe? It's like a car? Like, you have your car, and that's your car. And if you had to get another car, it would be okay, and you would pick the one that's right for you, and you would make it work. But if you just randomly had to drive any other random person's car, that would feel weird. Yeah, and you have to adjust the seat a bunch. Oh my god, and sometimes I'm tall enough that sometimes the seat doesn't go far back enough for me. And that sucks. I'm mm. short enough that sometimes the seat doesn't go high up enough for me. Oh my Same. god. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I just need to sit like so far up on the steering wheel to feel comfortable driving. I like to be very close to the steering. Me too. Some have said dangerously close. <laughs> <laughs> and like my pregnant belly is really fucking with that entire system right now oh my God. because I simply cannot. I tried to turn the other day and it like caught on my stomach and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so anyhow, I feel like the wand probably would have like maybe caught on his stomach a little bit, but otherwise been fine as long as he like won it fair and square. Mm -hmm. I see. Not going to be a perfect match, but it'll do. Yeah, making it work, making it work. Yeah, and maybe after a little while, the wand's like, I guess, you, I know you're an imposter, but I guess you're just, you're my magician now. <laughs> right, it's better than just laying in a corner forgotten somewhere. Maybe it's a fingerprint unlocking mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of these newfangled ones. They don't just make them with the thumbprint anymore. <laughs> It's a, got a face scanner to unlock your wand. But sometimes it doesn't work. You gotta, like, try it a couple times, you know? Well, I, I mean, I'm sure with Moody, he has a lot of trouble. Like, his face being all jacked up. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. And that's why all of those biometrics are fucking annoying and shitty. Uh, that doesn't work for everyone, man. I'm trying to imagine Moody having to reset his facial ID after losing an eye like motherfucking again. <laughs> Oh my god, wow. I'm sorry, we're going to need a positive facial ID for you to change your facial ID. Okay, wait, while we're on the subject, what about Tonk's facial scan to get onto her phone? She would have to always switch back. Mm. If I was going to do that as Tonks, I would intentionally contort myself into just, like some crazy face that no one else is going to have and just use that as my like face ID. It's a good yeah, idea. That's solid. So they, they can't use like a family portrait or whatever. How does Tonks know for sure what she looks like? 
great question. Maybe she doesn't. Maybe that's part of her character. Oh, my God. Get ready for Order of the Phoenix. Oh, boy. Coming soon to a podcast feed near That's you. like how butterflies can't never see their own wings. Oh, oh my God. I'm sorry. Wow. Nature's <laughs> incredible. Um, here's what you didn't ask about in your email, Adele. Um, uh, Adele, blah, 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 was thinking about the mechanics of Barty Crouch Jr. taking the polyjuice potion. Here's here's what I'm wondering about the mechanics of Barty Crouch Jr. taking the polyjuice potion. It has to be taken every hour. Has he not slept through the night since he took on this persona because he has to be up every hour basically to <laughs> breastfeed his baby in the middle of the night and the baby is him <laughs> needing I mean, polyjuice potion? The change doesn't actually take that long, right? So it's like in a scenario where like, he he had to like wake up and respond to a scenario quickly. He could probably just take a few chugs and like white knuckle through it for like ten minutes and then go. Yeah, I think well, no one would like. I think it would just be generally considered unwise to go bursting into Professor Moody's room unannounced, like on short notice. Like you gotta give him a sec. It feels like so high risk to be well, in your own body anywhere. <sighs> I feel like also, though, no one would think twice about Moody having an office that was, like, quadruple barricaded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But with, like, booby traps to make sound so he has, like, a warning. Well, and he didn't know he has the whole he has the whole mirror sneakoscope set up to, like, oh. ensure that no one sneaks up on him. Um, the mm. faux glass. Right. So I feel like he could just be, like, tracking on it. And anytime... Oh, my God, it's like a baby monitor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anytime someone gets too close, he's like, ah, motherfucking, he, like, chugs the polyjuice potion. And then has to get on the prosthetic leg and the prosthetic eye. Those are the parts that I, I won't get back into it. Oh, yeah, I won't get back into it, but it does drive me insane. P people with prosthetics though often take them off to give their body a break like they're not comfortable to be in all oh no time. that's not that's not my issue with that whole situation it's the fact that it's apparently written into his genetic code that he doesn't have an yeah. eye and a leg that's not how <laughs> not how that works but okay i just absolutely can't with it. um <laughs> thank you so much for the email adele i hope we answered your question i'm just gonna say that at the end of every everything i hope we answered your question it's just gonna sound a little more sarcastic every time <laughs> Well, it's not like we're actually answering anything. We're just bickering. <laughs> just bickering. That's what we're here for. Next, we have um, a, two questions from our boy Sam from the show Content and Capable, which is a show all about adulting. And if you haven't checked it out, you should. Uh, hi, Sam. Love you, bud. Sam asks, what has been a highlight this read through of the book? So, like, what is something that you specific that stands out against the rest when you think of reading Goblet of Fire with your pals for the past 10 months? Checks watch nine, eight to nine months. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, um. Okay. Great. <laughs> the thing is, we all actually hate each other. So. <laughs> Our friendship has been destroyed by this podcast. Um, but like, also. The book, though, like if there's any parts in the book that you're like, oh, yeah, that part. No, I that I, OK, I I had forgotten all about the like introduction of the elder Weasley boys. And I found that to be really charming on the reread, mm -hmm. like their their table and chair duel and like yeah. all their other just dumb, That's great. dumb antics of the elder Weasleys that are sprinkled throughout this book. I quite enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bros being bros. I liked that too. And I just have, honestly, I, this was the book I reread the most as a kid. So I'm su I was surprised of how much I didn't remember. But uh, I didn't, I mean, I, movie, the movie, I think, just like replaced all my memories. So like, I, you know, there's just so much more that happens. And I think like Winky, really, like her whole arc and how she ties everything together. Well, not, I mean, not. Not well, but like, you know. I mean, yeah, she is like the the connecting thread for a lot of the books. And story. all her very fucked up shit and imagery and alcoholism and I think in general one of the strong suits about this book is that it really widens your understanding of the wizarding world in a pretty extreme way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like I, this is the point where it becomes a world. This is also the point where, to me, this becomes a series instead of, like, clearly a publisher renewing book by book. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think narratively it has a lot to offer, and then I think it has a lot to offer in world building as well. Mm -hmm. And it's also, like, in terms of the the mystery involved, it's so much 
more ambitious in a lot of ways, because this is like a scheme. This is like a long game. And are there holes? Hell yeah. There, it, This whole plan was very, very precarious. And I think that the thing that kind of made this experience different for me this time around was getting into exactly how contrived the whole plan was and mm -hmm. how it still works as a narrative. Because it's like, would this have actually worked? If all of this was literally real and this was the plan, would the plan have worked in actual fucking reality? It, no, there's... This is nuts. But as a story, you just never question it. Right. Like, as a kid, especially. Yeah. Like, it's... I, how many times have I read this book over and over and over and never it's questioned like so much of this shit? It's just, like, far too convoluted of a plot for you to be... To, no one should expect themselves to be able to suss it out. Yeah, no, like, you wouldn't spot it... Like, as much as we ended up doing, unless you were going through chapter by chapter with a bunch of people who consider literary analysis a hobby. Weirdos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> okay, so Sam's next question, and I think we answered this a little bit, is what has been something that you completely forgot about? So I, I actually did hear a couple of those from y'all, but anything else to add? I mean, I don't remember anything about any of these books at this point. That's right, a character trait. Yeah, so you trait. completely forgot about the whole book. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I was pleasantly surprised. <laughs> um, I truly don't know if I can answer this question because I, I don't, I can't think of anything that I like. I read this book over the summer before we read this book this season. So I just, I just feel like I know this book very, very well. Yeah. I mean, th there was that one movie moment that drove me to drink. Uh, oh my God, Haley. <laughs> That was so oh. specific. And earlier this episode. I feel like there was at least one thing that I hadn't spotted. that I remembered not spotting in the book and being surprised by. Oh, but wait, I can't remember I actually, what it was. Haley, I think this was on one episode that we... I think this was on an episode we were on together. This is so specific. <laughs> is that is that uh, in one line after it's revealed that Moody was Barty Crouch Jr. the whole time, it's referring to him as Barty... Barty Jr. But then there's like one instance where it still says Moody. And you and I were both like, uh-huh. Uh, they missed it. Um, that's incredibly specific. That is incredibly <laughs> but, specific, but, we but well it. done. <laughs> Great job remembering that thing that we both noticed not remembering before. <laughs> okay, so buckle up, y'all, because it's time for our longest owl mail perhaps ever. I can, don't know for sure. I don't keep track of it. But this is from... James. <clears throat> James, thank you for the owl mail. Hi, I'm James. My name is James. Sam's brother, not Harry's dad. Yes, that's <laughs> Sam. Good day, etc. This, That's what it says. Sam was listening to the episode on The Dream out loud at dinner. And at the part where you guys were talking about cramming for exams, I was quite concerned about the state of wizard, the wizard education system. Everybody is, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, wizard maths. Fair. The goblins do all their accountancy. But how do any of them know that two butter beers at searches up Harry, Harry Potter weird money system, 25 nuts isn't two sickles, 75 nuts, and half a packet of birdie bots. Other than that, I think the muggles have got them covered for any random math stuff they might need, I say as one of those muggles learning maths at university. So we all know the math does make sense, and I am planning, this is me, Christina, interjecting, a bonus episode about it over on our Patreon, uh, eventually, about wizard maths. So, uh, James goes on, Secondly, and far more importantly, how are any wizards literate at all? I mean, Snape just adds rolls of parchment to his assignments, but these guys would barely have been taught to put quill to paper if they've never done primary school phonics. I find it very hard to believe that Ron has gone from eating dirt and throwing gnomes to writing three rolls of parchment with no schooling at all. Harry and Hermione have the bonus of having attended muggle schools, but Ron probably only had his parents and siblings to learn from. And there we run into another problem. Pure bloods. Ignoring literally everything about pure bloods except what's relevant, they would have no one literate in their entire family. They've been wizards so long that the most recent member of their family that would have learnt the little squiggles that communicates the things 
uh, would be their estranged great 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 uncle Bruce who wanted to become a poet. Fair, someone probably went and got taught by muggles at some point in their ancestry so they could pass it down. But surely they'd institutionalize that into some uh, send your little tykes to learn languages thing by the 20th century. Uh, ooh, I wonder what that would be called. Okay, great. Um, we're maybe like 75% done with this email. Uh, maybe like 60%. Okay. There's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> then we also easily forget that, s that reading is a necessary wizarding skill. They read history, potion recipes, spells, and sometimes backwards assortments of letters on top of fancy mirrors of Aristad. Where are these wizards learning basic skills? Anyway, I propose that wizards henceforth be sent to school spelled with a K because that's very original and not a ripoff of a muggle thing at all where they are given mini underpowered wands so they can blast the shit out of each other's four foot selves all the while learning verbs are doing words and getting their pen license. Why with wands? Because it's all about the drama. <laughs> I think I've covered some glaring problems with a lack of wizard school. However, I do have one last question, which I thought of while writing this. Where did the wizards come from? <laughs> <laughs> I've spent a lot of time dunking on purebloods disconnect from muggle kind, but they've all are they all descended from muggles or did they just appear validating the theory of our good friend, Bruce, the poet being the only literate pureblood hope. This keeps you up at night. Love your work here on the pod and keeping my insane brother in check. Insert relevant Australian sign-off, James. <laughs> well, James, when a mommy magician and a daddy magician love each other very much, <laughs> they do a sort of special duel. <laughs> and that's where wizards come from. So here's the thing about the entire literacy issue. Um, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but you're very attached to a modern understanding of schooling that hasn't existed for much of human history like mm -hmm. the formal education a, a formalized especially like legalized education is not a thing that has existed for a really long time actually mm -hmm. and before that we still had books and people learning to write and read and stuff yeah maybe you know? it's because i'm an english person but i do feel like i could at least teach my kids to read even though i'm not an educator <laughs> So here's the thing. Everyone teaches their kids to read. Oh, yeah, like, I guess you're right. You you don't school actually. School helps a little bit, maybe. Uh, school helps formalize it when mm. parents are working. But, like, you don't drop your kid off with no, having never seen a book. You know what I mean? True. Hopefully having seen 100,000 books. I mean, but it's it's true. It's I mean, people mostly teach their own kids to read. School tends mm -hmm. to teach them to write, but that has more to do with the fact that we currently live in a society where both parents are expected to be working. And prior to that being the societal norm, if you learned to read and write, you did it at home. And like most people, like the idea of a, a primary school or an elementary education didn't exist at all. You started school with like when you were like seventh grade, roughly. Mm. I see. That is a very good point about wizard school i was given an opportunity to better myself through learning at a strange place called chewel i do also though wish that that had been addressed at all in the books right. like like i want to know what that looks like in yeah. in this society you know I i have a feeling that it's really just like bumming around with your parents or if you're bougie as hell especially like you know just going back to like societal structures really if you're a pure blood you've got money your family's doing this whole thing you think they aren't paying for private tutors oh no <laughs> pure like i like i'm sure that draco malfoy had like private tutors but like mm -hmm. I, I i feel like it would be kind of like if everybody has to do it Pretty much everybody that like already lives in the society has to teach their own kids and just knows that. I feel like there would be some line of resources involved of like, here's like line, big lined paper for when you're teaching your three year old to write with a quill for the first time. I, I think the, the thing, the way that if this was going to be an issue, I'd love to see this play out in the book is, like, the muggles all show up and the wizard kids showed up and there are, like, subtle differences in spelling and grammar between what's acceptable in one society and what's see, acceptable in oh, another. That's, that's, why, that's why I want to see, like, the mechanics because I feel like that would be really cool. I do think that 
considering the quill and parchment situation, I can see a kid knowing how to like write basically and like with any device that you stick in their hand, like a number two pencil. The quill and ink seems harder to me that you you need to. Yeah, I feel is. like someone needs to supervise that until it's appropriate. Like, have you ever tried <laughs> writing with a nib pen? It's it's extremely uh-huh. hard. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, and fine motor skills. I mean, they take some time. Can I recommend my uh. I think they're Sharpie S Joe's. Oh, yeah, baby. Pens I've been loving lately. They're good yeah, shit. They're sexy. And then we're not touching math. Sorry. <laughs> we're not touching math. Well, we're doing a whole episode about it. I actually invited Andrew and Taylor to join me on that episode. And I think I'm going to do a lot of listening. Um, I'm going to do a lot <laughs> Active of listening, listening on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Better you um, than me, because I would be going cross-eyed about five minutes in. And I know I plan ahead, but it is coming out on Pi Day 2023, and I've been planning it for a while because we're scheduled to have a bonus episode come, come out on Pi Day. So I was like, well, we will be talking about math. That's so cute of us. But yeah, like, but, you know, fair questions on all of this, because like that, I have been wondering all of that for a very long time. Yeah. Okay, I have just like a couple last questions and then we'll get her done. We'll just put Goblet of Fire away and just walk boldly on. But first, do any of y'all remember reading this book for the first time? Yes. Mm -hmm. I do. You do? Okay. Does anyone remember how they felt like closing this book and putting it down when it was done? I think, and I touched on this earlier, but I, I had a really... Uh, a sense of the expansiveness of the world you mm-hmm. know this was the first book I had to wait for mm. yeah Um, where it was like because I kind of crushed the first three books that were already out this was my first I think we went over this early in this at one point. season what have you Um, but it's like this was my first like midnight release party this was like the first time I like really had to wait for it, it was the first time I was, I think it was the first time I was reading a book in my life where it was like, I know that there are more planned <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and they will be released at a later date and I will have to wait for that. Yeah. So um, I think there were a couple of things that really interested me about it. One is I think I still have it. I was like unpacking books recently and there were all of these like weird guides that came out around this time of like demystifying Harry Potter and looking at like what might be foreshadowed in future books and stuff like that. And so it was closing this book was the first time I really dipped into a fandom where I think probably this is the book that like locked in the fandom as like its own thing. Yeah. Yeah. This is probably the book when they started, when Hot Topic started selling merch (laughs) Mm -hmm. in earnest. Yeah. Yeah. This book blew my mind. (laughs) Yeah. I finished reading it and I think I read it in, probably a day a couple days i also think i went to um if not a midnight it was i remember it being dark outside so maybe it was a midnight book release at barnes and noble or borders or whatever Mm -hmm. um and yeah i i just um i laughed and cried and i remember feeling scared reading it and um and like staying up really late and hiding under the covers yeah i think after that i definitely was a fan for life (laughs) for sure I can't remember the exact sequence of events, but I think that because my mom was reading these to me, like it was like a bonding thing that we did. We would have popcorn and I would rub her feet and she would read the books aloud and do the voices. Oh, Cat I don't know if the you've voices. mentioned that since the very first episode we talked uh, about it at length. I don't know if you've mentioned that in so long. I feel, like I've, I feel like I've mentioned it offhand a few times. I have a very important Bridget question. Yeah? <laughs> um, did she switch voices from oh, yeah. the voice she was using for Moody to when Moody became revealed as Bertie Crouch? Yes, she did. I remember wow. distinctly. God, yeah. What a woman <laughs> yeah yeah man that, that's a mom catch right there my mom goes hard um <laughs> <laughs> so like we had gotten the first one i uh, i was grounded it was the one time i got grounded i wasn't supposed she to be says, watching she tv says so gleefully <laughs> <laughs> we're so cheerful. i wasn't supposed to watch more than like an hour of tv but like she caught me watching animaniacs with the volume turned way down so like two weeks no tv so but then she felt bad because i was bored so we went out and we got the first book and that thus started the tradition. And, like, we got through the first three, and I think right around the time we finished the third book was when the fourth one came out. And, you know, this was pre-internet. 
like you had a computer maybe but you didn't have like the internet so we just kind of found out incidentally like oh holy sh- oh oh okay we can go get the fourth one now great i think it was like a couple days after it had come out and i all i remember of like when it finished like when she finished reading it was realizing oh no Oh no, I got lucky once, I'm not gonna get lucky again, now I actually do have to wait. No! (laughs) Now I'm just stuck in Alabama. Oh wow, Haley. It always comes back to Alabama. (laughs) It always fucking does, I'm not happy about it either. Yeah, Alabama gets way too much fucking (laughs) airtime. Um, I don't really remember reading this book for the first time. The only thing I really... I just feel like I associate this book with a time in my life when I started to read more adult and complex books. And so I don't really remember reading it, but I definitely remember how I felt like after reading it, like kind of yeah. empowered as a reader. I, I, I remember it awakening something in me. Yeah, it was, for sure. It, it was, start, I, it, it's like when I started reading grown up books. Yeah, me. it was like an adventure. Yes. It was also by far the longest book I'd ever yeah. read, and I'm yeah, sure that was sure. the same for most and of you. And then for the next 10 years after this, I could read 800-page books, like, overnight. Can't do, can't do that anymore. I've been reading Mistborn for, like, three months, because I just, like, can't... I'm like, oh, God, 20 pages at a time is the most I can do. Okay, so who was y'all's favorite character in Goblet of Fire? And let's talk about the books, the, the book only right now, not the movie. You know, try to Try to release the movie from your brain. I actually love Victor Crumb in this book. He's oh, such yeah. a weird fucking dude. <laughs> and every time he pops up in a scene, it's like a total scene stealer based on the way that other characters react to him or the, the things that he will just do and say are so outlandish. And like, <laughs> I, I quite enjoy just watching him bobble his way through being a teen celebrity. Yeah. I, re- I respect the hell out of that scene in the books where Victor Crumb is like, Harry, what about Hermione? I don't. No, it's a lot of English, sorry. And <laughs> Harry, Harry's like, yo, I we're just friends. And Victor Crumb's like, all right, I trust you. Hey, man, you fly really good. And that's the most endearing character moment, I think, in like the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's either being really outlandishly weird or, like, painfully, painfully average. <laughs> yeah. Like, wow, you really are just some guy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> most people are just some guy. I, I gotta say, I know he's an imposter, but Moody, like, <laughs> he's so fun. <laughs> yeah, very fun. A lot of drama. Like, it's heartbreaking to me that that's not actually him, but I don't know. We meet him in the next book. He seems pretty consistent. <laughs> I mean, it, he kind of, like, does all the things that you would do if you were Im- impersonating someone who was a little bit insane like it's like barty crouch mm-hmm. gives himself all the permission <laughs> you know what i mean yeah the whole ferret thing was bold yeah <laughs> there's a lot of bold moves <laughs> <laughs> leela who is your favorite character in goblet of fire i'd like to also don't want to say this one because i feel like it's so obvious but i really enjoyed you know getting to meet and get to know cedric the little bit that we get to know of him he, I, I said mm-hmm. in another episode he could have been written with so much more character development and um, in a, I guess, more interesting way. But even so, um, I feel like we're given so little of the side characters in these books. So I, I just appreciate how tender he is and, like, he seems like a great leader and a nice friend and seemed. Um, Past tense. <laughs> Yeah, I liked we, Cedric. We get a lot of little, like, amuse bouche of, like, different side characters. Yeah. It's, like, just mm-hmm. enough to be like, is that goat cheese and blackberry? And then they're dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do think that, you know, this is this is a Harry Potter slander podcast, but it's also a literary analysis podcast. And there are <laughs> genuinely great things that you can take out of this series as a writer. And uh, one of the things that that bitch excels in is creating like a huge cast from very quick strokes and so like for sure so much we want with so much of these like little glimpses we want more but that's the beauty of it because it's like yeah this is a huge world and we don't have time to really get to know every single person even if they're important to the story but what we do have is enough to work with that we want to engage with the story more and like we're wondering actively like What's up with this guy? 
If you're a writer, this is the flip side of why Game of Thrones stopped working in the later books. Mm. Because you don't need to know a side character's favorite vegetable. <laughs> if they're right. just going to deliver for a letter. Sure. You know what yeah, I mean? for sure. For sure. For sure. For sure. <laughs> That's an amazingly well put point. <laughs> I, I'm, I don't know if this person was my favorite character, but I just want to shout out. Fleur Delacour, who I think is so wronged by this whole narrative. I will back any bitch who's trying her best. And I just wish that the story had been able to do her better. Mm. Like, she actually comes in with a whole lot of bad bitch energy. Yes. And And she doesn't follow through at all. (laughs) Well, she also just gets wronged by the fact that most of this story is told by a teen boy. And or from the, the general perspective of a teen boy, and it's a teen boy that thinks she's hot, and she's like, "I don't know you." <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, for sure. Did y'all have like a least favorite character? Maybe, maybe someone you thought was like particularly deliciously like evil, or someone who was just like a really poorly written character. Like looking back on it, um, I feel like Molly Weasley disappointed me in this book. Oh, yeah, with the Hermione yeah. thing. Wow, yeah. You know, I'm like, Molly. For sure. Moms don't get to take sides like that. You have to be nice yeah. to everybody. For me, I would say it's Winky, just because... Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, there's so many uncomfortable implications that, like, it's... I feel bad for her situation, but every... It could have... All of that could have been handled so much better and it just made her come off as just annoying Mm -hmm. and it's like i want to sympathize with your situation i am primed to sympathize with your situation and the way that all of this is being set up is in a way that kind of turns you into a joke in a way that i find very grating yeah um honestly that same kind of thing happens with Hermione too with Spew. That's what i was thinking treating like treating her like she's a joke it's almost like the author hates women The whole Winky thing is like the biggest swing and the hardest miss. Because I I agree that's my least favorite character in this book because it's just like, I don't know. Does anyone like Winky? In in all of the Harry Potter fandom shit I've ever seen, I've never seen a single thing written about Winky. I've never seen anyone cosplay as Winky. Like (laughs) they cut her completely out of the movies. Like you have to. Doesn't exist. The movies made the right choice cutting out the whole self thing entirely. And she's and we already established earlier in this very episode that she's like the common thread of the whole convoluted book plot, and they cut her completely out. Like that whole thread that she was connecting. They just got rid of for the movie, and we kind of didn't miss it. Like, yeah. even the fandom isn't like, well, someone needs to do winky justice. Everyone's like, not touching it. Oh, no, mm. Yeah, not touching it. Just, it's, let's just throw out the whole suitcase. I'm not unpacking this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, oh, poor winky being packed in a suitcase and then just <laughs> yeeted off the London Bridge. Honestly, I, I would feel better doing that than all of this. Like, it's just put her out of her fucking misery, for God's Such sake. Such a cruel death, surrounded by clothing. Oh my god. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be clothing. I'd pack her in there with towels. She'd die happy. <laughs> oh no. Conceptually, I want to throw it all out conceptually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, my least favorite character in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire is one Severus Snape. Because this character in the Goblet of Fire, he doesn't do anything except for have a dark mark. That's something he does. The other thing he does is he talks shit about Hermione's mm. teeth when she gets jinxed and they grow extra long, and he's like, I see no uh. difference. And he makes her cry and hate herself and and change her face. <laughs> she changes her face after that incident. And then the other thing he does is when Rita Skeeter is publishing Salander about Harry Potter, Severus fucking Snape reads it aloud to the class that has this kid's bullies in it and pauses for laughter. Pauses for laughter! <laughs> well, what's going to happen? Are his parents going to sue the school? Uh, this guy is not a good guy. And here's the thing. The movie drops these two instances. And we all know who Alan Rickman is. 
he's the best. And I think that the con- contemporary narrative of who Severus Snape as a person rides on this movie, making a choice for Alan Rickman to just be cute and not do much, rather than showing these two horrifying scenes of bullying of a kid from an adult. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll stop. But I'm impassioned. Snape <laughs> sucks dick in the not fun way. <laughs> Yeah, in the not fun way. True. That's very true. That's I was going to say you can't make that your answer if it's going to be the answer for every fucking book. But no, he is particularly awful in this one, isn't he? Yeah, it's not yeah. even like deliciously awful like Lucius, you know, like. No, it's it yeah. really is just like in a in a rumors you heard about teachers in your own public school kind of way. And here's the thing about Snape is at the end of this book, he does something that I consider to be extremely cool. And it's not, it it is not, it doesn't outweigh though the shittiness. But at the end of this book, Dumbledore's like, are you ready to like go be my spy again? And he's like, I'm fucking ready. And then he walks right into it. And I, I respect that. But it's not, it doesn't save his character at all. No. Still sucks. This book in particular does irreparable damage to Snape's character. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the very last question of this episode. And thanks, gals, for hanging hanging in with me so long. Um, we're about to wrap it on up here. I just want to know, what of the three is your favorite task? Don't think about if you were a spectator, because obviously that's dumb. Just the movie and or book portrayal, like, which is your favorite task? The maze is my very best answer, because it is just the weirdest sandbox of things. Like, we we casually get introduced to the fact that the Sphinx is an actual mythological creature in this universe yeah. and it never comes up again. I fucking love yeah. it. It's so yeah. weird. <laughs> nice. Haley, what about you? I'm going to have to go with the dragon. Um, I'm not answering as a spectator, but I am taking that into account because <laughs> I think that it's the only like, one you can see. There's a ta- yeah. well. There's a task and there's a challenge. Are they all interesting challenges? Yes. If I was doing event planning, God forbid, uh, and I had to be <laughs> no, no one, <laughs> no one make me do event planning. But I, would I do not know have the an difference. Event planner than have Haley's oh. planner. Haley, I'm sorry, but if someone hired you as an event planner, all the rest of us would have to be doing that job. Because you would be just, like, on the floor with post-it notes, like, <laughs> did anyone order food? <laughs> no, I absolutely should not be in charge. If I was on a team, though, I've been on event planning teams not in charge of things, where I belong, goddammit. I don't like being in charge of things. Not everyone does. But if I was involved in the planning of the Triwizard Tournament, I mm-hmm. think I think I would have if no one else pointed out that no one can see the other two, I think I, it would have come up. Surely it would have come up. And I feel like in terms of just all around execution and idea, like it's dragons, it's classic. You get past it, you figure out a way, you assume they're going to cheat, but you don't make it something completely undoable for a 17 year old. And it's key point fucking visible. Just it's, Mm-hmm. If it's gonna okay. be a spectator sport, so then make it a fucking spectator sport. I'm, d- <laughs> I am considering it. I'm, I'm considering it as the best planned task. She's an event planner now, guys. I no, no, do not put that on me. <laughs> email, email the pod to ask about booking Haley to plan your wedding. God, no, please, God, no. If Wait, you would like can, a disaster marriage, can <laughs> we can we go back to the Canavada Cadaver kill yourself because that's suddenly relevant to me again? Um, I truly, truly don't ask me to plan anything ever. Leela, what is your favorite task in the Goblet of Fire? Well, I simply feel like I must say the second task just because it came out on February February 24th, the dreary, dreary day, which is the day of my birth. And it was our 100th episode. Indeed. And it was Taylor's birthday, too. Yes. I mean, obviously, it's the worst one, right? <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, but that's the one you pick. Yeah, as the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the definitely for me. It was would be the scariest one because I can't it's swim. Fun. It's fun to read. Yeah, <laughs> guys, did you guys each pick one of three? Mm-hmm. Because I said I told myself I was just gonna vote for the underdog. Tiebreaker. <laughs> this is a lot of 
pressure. High pressure. As an event planner, which no. one? <laughs> <laughs> I reject my destiny as an event planner, and okay. I, well, you keep doing it. All wait, wait, hold on, hold on. So you do have the fourth option, which was the graveyard battle for your life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I I don't choose that one. That was my favorite because really it was like no one planned it, but it somehow <laughs> challenged the contestants more. It like does give RuPaul's Drag Race like lip sync for your life vibes. <laughs> Cedric died. <laughs> okay, well, I, I mean, like, it's like, we're, it's like, I am dead, you know? I'm, but he was really actually dead. It's like, I'm dead, but I'm living. <laughs> There's also, like, an extra dose of trauma for having to see the ghosts of your parents fight for you. Uh, okay, guys. Yeah. Okay, everyone shut up. My favorite task in the Goblet of Fire <laughs> is the maze. And that's, for sure, a book only thing. The movie maze is so dumb, but the book maze has some cool stuff in it, and we get to see it. And it's also just like spoo- like generally spoopy. Like mazes be spoopy. Yes, Haley. I would like to present you with a possible fifth option that I think you'll like: so asking someone out. out to the Yule Ball. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, I, I ask. I, I personally would be great at asking someone out to the Yule Ball. All right. But you enjoyed watching him struggle, didn't you? (laughs) Um, It is painful. That whole thing is painful. Cho Chang as a character is kind of painful because the author hates women. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I keep screaming. Um, Oh, guys, we're supposed to end on a cheerful note. (laughs) My favorite task. I <laughs> You didn't like the death and graveyard <laughs> jokes? That wasn't strong enough for you? Um, yeah, and it's hard to even get, like, pumped up about going into Order of the Phoenix because, like, it just, uh, it just gets sadder and more fucked up. Just play the angst, angst, angst uh, clip from fucking Pop Wizard House. Angst. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll do. I mean, I think that the the big thing to get hyped for looking forward is is all of the cool adult characters we get to meet in the subsequent books. That's, that is yeah. a great point. Yeah. Some real world shit at last. Right. And like, not that we don't love angsty teens, but like, <laughs> man, what a perfect time if you're going to write a whole book about angsty teens to also be like, here's some well-adjusted adults doing cool shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, is it time to move on to plugs? Sure. Thank you for your enthusiastic <laughs> response. I would love to start by plugging our Patreon account. For as little as a dollar a month, you can become part of our online community on our Discord server, which is a very fun place to be. At our $5 a month tier, we do monthly bonus episodes. And in June, we're doing a little, uh, what's it called? Uh, like ad-, ad libs, because it's not Mad Libs brand. <laughs> Uh, we did a Harry Potter uh, ad libs like way back in the beginning. I think it was one of our first couple of Patreon bonus episodes. And I only did books like one, two, maybe three. But um, we're going to be doing some more ad libs, mad libs Fun. in June. Yeah. yeah. Um, Brooke, where can people find you on the internet? Um, you can find me on Instagram at Passion for Parks. You can find me on Twitter at Grumpy Brooke. And um, I would like to plug chips and queso. Yeah. Here's the thing. (laughs) Just in general. (laughs) Yeah, I'm pregnant. I've been eating a lot of chips and queso um, and potato salad. Uh, Chips and queso actually goes great with potato salad. Chips go good in potato salad and queso goes good on top of potato salad. I'm just saying. (laughs) Who knew? Like. (laughs) If She's you're like gazing into the distance with a dreamy, <laughs> dreamy look on her face. It's like the happiest I've ever seen you. And I was at your wedding. I've tried a variety of different quesos recently. And can I just say, there's not a miss in the bunch. Damn. Like, even your general jar of Tostitos queso is actually way better than you think it is. So unless you're lactose intolerant, honestly, go to the grocery store and get yourself some nice tortilla chips. Good shit. And go get yourself any container of queso microwave that shit if you're feeling the potato salad i'm realizing the more i'm saying that that's really just a me thing right now but like if you want to throw <laughs> no, in some potato no, no. salad it sounds like good in theory i love sure. potato salad like switch back and forth get yourself chips and some potato salad and some queso and just eat back and forth between those and i i promise you you're in for a good night 
Nice. I love that wholehearted endorsement. Thank you so much, Brooke. <laughs> Haley, where can people find you on the internet? Hello, I'm Haley. If you must, you can follow me on Twitter at the Rit to Wit. And my plug for this episode is Dracula Daily. Gentle listeners, have you ever read Dracula? Probably not. Most people haven't. It's one of the most highly adapted stories of is, all time. Have you, have you read the book, Haley? I have. Is uh, it good? It was many years ago, but honestly, yes. Uh, okay, great. Dracula. Isn't Dracula. Sorry. Isn't Dracula the <laughs> book that was like translated into Icelandic, but actually the author just wrote a totally different book? I think Whoa. it was. Whoa. I've got to Google this now. <laughs> Hold on. You continue. Uh, so wow. if you're not aware, there's a lot of shit in Dracula, the book that never made it into any of the 400 plus I'm not making that up adaptations since the book was written. Um, for example, there's a fucking cowboy in Dracula. He's a major character. Doesn't make it into most of the adaptations. Uh, the second thing is that the entire book is an epistolary. So it's all letters and journal entries and newspaper clippings that are telling this whole story and make it feel kind of more real. Full disclosure, it's also written by a... Uh, late British imperialist guy who had a lot of problems with Eastern Europeans and Jews. Uh, so that's, you know, an angle that does occasionally come up. But for the most part, it's a really fun book. Dracula Daily is an email subscription where they send you every single uh, piece of what makes up the story on the day that it's dated, which isn't necessarily how the book is set up. Like, it's not all chronological order. So you're basically getting to read Dracula in a completely new format. Whoa. And it just sends you emails from, like, May to November every single year to tell you the full story of Dracula. So you'll just sit there and get emails from your good buddy, Jonathan Harker, who's on a fun trip to Transylvania. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that's Dracula Daily. A lot of fun. Reader beware about the, you know, Victorians being Victorians, but that aside, it's it's worth reading. Were you telling me about this when we were camping? Probably. <laughs> I have, like, a very distant memory of it, but I think it was just from me being super fucked up less than a week ago. Yeah, well. I did just want to jump in here and say that I did confirm the Icelandic translation of Dracula is actually a markedly different book. Characters are named differently. They added in a bunch of sex scenes. No one discovered oh. that this was different until 2014. Whoa! Wait, that's very what? Fun. I remember hearing about all of that. I did not remember the 2014 part. Yeah, basically people were like just reading it in Icelandic, the, what they thought was the book, and like there wasn't enough crossover between like the original Bram Stoker novel, the English adaptation, and like the Icelandic adaptation that people were reading all three as a comparative. Um, you so know that and it that was called Powers of Darkness, and it was like translated into a totally different of the version of the book in like the eighteen hundreds. So it's it's been a long time that this has been what Icelandic people thought was the official story. I mean, that's, on the one hand, that's amazing, but on the other hand, so few people have actually sat down and read Dracula all the way through that I can see how it happened. Um, so anyhow, if you can get your hands on an English translation of the Icelandic fake Dracula, apparently it's a much better book. <laughs> <laughs> even the original i cannot stress this enough has a very polite cowboy so like <laughs> you're missing out man his name's quincy cute cute i love that Haley, that was your fucking plug right yes it was <laughs> <laughs> lila where can people find you on the internet Hello, listeners. I've been Leela. You can find me um, on Instagram and Twitter at Leels for Reels. And um, make sure uh, to follow because I think I'm going to um, continue singing and maybe post some new music. So stay tuned. And for my plug, I am going to plug this book that I'm just darn certain has been plugged before because our book club read it but i just decided at the time that i didn't want to so um now like months and months and months later i just like ripped through it in like uh, a week um it is iron widow 
I don't have the book with me and I can't tell you who wrote it. Tina. Their name is Zirin J. Joe. Yes. It is amazing. It's a really, really great book. Brook? Oh. <laughs> oh. Thinking um, about her. Huh? Yeah. And it's great for, well, it's okay for Pride Month. Yeah, no, it'll do. It'll do. <laughs> it'll do. It'll do in a in a pickle. <laughs> um, it's it's got some queer rep. It's got some queer rep. Um, and it's just really well written. Um, I love a well written uh, and original dystopian fiction that I feel like can actually kind of surprise me because I just feel like I've read mm-hmm. so many mm-hmm. books like that. Um, and this one just absolutely does. Um, I kept t- describing it and talking about it so much that Jason made us fucking watch Pacific Rim again the other night. And I, I don't care for that movie, <laughs> but this book is like a, just like a much better version of that movie. <laughs> so yeah, um, check it out. I feel like it has something in there for everyone, honestly. So you can't go wrong. Iron Widow by, say it again. Zirin J. Zhao. Zirin J. Zhao. My name's Christina. I've been your host. You know where to find me. And I don't even know what I'm trying to plug this month. Maybe just reading. You did already <laughs> plug the Patreon. Yeah. And, oh, I always start by oh, plugging yeah. the Patreon. And then I usually like circle back to plug something meaningful. Oh, so okay, I just yeah, felt yeah. it felt like I should. But I don't have I just I just think that you should take some time this summer to read if you're the kind of person who likes reading. Yeah. Here's the thing. You're going to sign up for the Dracula thing. That's going to be your entry point to reading for the yeah. day. You're going to read a chapter of Iron Widow in the evening, and you're going to do it with a bowl of chips and queso. <laughs> yes. And in that way, yes. you can have the best of all worlds. You are going to have to catch up on Dracula Daily. It did start on May 3rd, so we're about a month in. Oh, no. Wow. <laughs> but they wow, have an archive. You're already, you're already late. You're already late. you got to know what's happening with Jonathan. <laughs> And also, I really should, I should have made more of a deal about this, but it really is June 1st, the first day of Pride Month. And here's the thing. I had a really cool Pride Month episode scheduled for today, but then here's what I did. I took a break and my episodes got bumped back a week. So our Pride Month episode is coming out next week. I it's, It is all Pride all the time here, but we're covering some uh, like particularly like queer related content next week. Hey, Tina, you know what's queer culture? Self-care. Thank you so much. It's actually in a fortnight. I don't think it's next week. I think it's in a fortnight. We're on a fortnightly schedule now. I'm actually going to check my schedule to see if that's even true. No, it is true. We're it's finishing fortnightly. on a real strong note. <laughs> it's fortnightly. <laughs> <laughs> so check back on June 15th for our episode about Sorted, which is a very cool memoir I'm excited to talk about. Cool. Anyway... Great episode, everyone. Good job. Good work. Thanks so much. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. I'm pointing at them, and I appreciate you. And then we put Goblet of Fire back on the shelf. Damn. Close it up. Put it to sleep. <gasps> it's sleeping now. With Cedric. That's my boy! <laughs> the Restricted Section is thrilled to be a member of the Movie Night Crew Podcast Network, which features amazing other podcasts such as My Cabbages, an Avatar podcast. My Cabbages is an Avatar The Last Airbender podcast that was started by two lovable nerds during a global pandemic to stave off their inevitable existential crisis. Coffee. Tea. Honor. Cabbage. Long ago, the four elements lived in harmony. Then, shit went totally cray when the Avatar attacked. Only the Cabbage Man merchant to fine cruciferous vegetables could stand against his trolling. But when the world needed some dank veg, he vanished. Ten years have passed, and my partner and I have started a new podcast. My Cabbages! An Avatar podcast. A weekly show about Avatar The Last Airbender. Whether it's Sokka's new line of cologne. Hey, look at you, sitting there <laughs> on a seal. Well, now look at back at me. I'm on an on a even bigger seal. Now look away. <laughs> D&D related antics. You have to make an acrobatics check for that. And Aang just like unzips his pants and whips out his D20s. He's just like, I got this. Or randomly breaking into song. <laughs> Some go bending waterfall. We'll stumble our way through the greatest show ever made, one episode at a time. You can reach us at CabbageCast, which is our Twitter, or subscribe wherever you catch pod. Rotten cabbages? What kind of slum do you think this is? The Restricted Section was created by me, Christina Kahn, based on the book series by J.K. Rowling. All music by Ryan Kahn. 
logo by Michael Hardison. Support us on patreon.com slash restricted section. For as little as a dollar a month, you can gain access to our Discord community server, which is a really happy place to be. And there are other rewards as well, such as bonus episodes and Zoom happy hour hangouts. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Restricted Section Pod, on Twitter at Restricted Pod, and on Facebook at Restricted Section Pod. Also, feel free to shoot us an email at restrictedsectionpod at gmail.com to share your thoughts, feelings, complaints, conspiracy theories, or even lavish praise. You cannot possibly frustrate Christina uh, with technology more than I have in the past. That movie sucked. I kind of liked it. Movie Night Crew Network.